recording. I'd like to say good morning to everyone and welcome you to the Ithaca Branch class. My name is Pam Venuti and I'll be your moderator this morning. <clears throat> this is a school and not a church and neither are we affiliated with any religious organizations. This school is uh, dedicated to showing proof of the existence of Yahweh our Elohim and the operation of his eternal purpose, pattern, and plan operating throughout eternity to this present day. This school was established as a result of a divine vision and revelation given to Dr. Henry Clifford Kinley in the state of Ohio in the year 1931. Um, this Ithaca branch was established in 1979. At this time, I'd like to introduce you to the Dean of the Ithaca branch, Dr. Um, Robert White, <clears throat> excuse me, and our host, Dr. Gregory Prestis. In this school, we use the true, correct, and original name and title of the Heavenly Father, the Word or Son, and the Holy Spirit, which are contained in the original Hebrew text. The true name of our Heavenly Father is Yahweh. It has been improperly substituted by Lord. The true title of the Word or Son is Elohim. It has been improperly substituted by God. And the name of the Holy Spirit manifested in or out of a physical body is Yahshua. It has been erroneously substituted by Jesus Christ. Lord and God are titles and not names. The Apostle Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, tells us in 1 Corinthians 8 and 5 that there are Lord's many and there are God's many. But we now know that each Lord must have a name and each God must have a name also. Elohim is a title, but unlike Lord and God, Elohim is a divine title. That means that Elohim is the title the creator chose for himself. Jesus is a name, <clears throat> excuse me, but it's an erroneous name. A minor investigation on your part into a good dictionary or encyclopedia would prove that neither the Hebrew, the Greek, nor the Latin languages contain any characters or letters that would produce the sound that's made by the letter J. Neither was there a J in the English language until some 1400 years after the death of the Messiah, therefore making such names as Jesus and Jehovah impossible renderings of the true and original name of our Father and the Son. Christ is a title just like Lord and God. Yahweh is pure spirit, and in this state he is incomprehensible and inscrutable. He is the ultimate source, substance, limits, and bounds of everything. We have Yahweh in his pure spirit state symbolized on this chart as a cloud. Yahweh is not a cloud. He merely chose a cloud to symbolize himself because a cloud has no particular or descriptive shape or form. We have drawn the cloud all around the edges of this chart to show you that everything on this chart is within the cloud. In like manner, everything in the universe abides within the pure spirit state of Yahweh. Yahweh, knowing that man could not perceive of him in this pure spirit state, took on shape and took on form right within himself as Elohim. This is the word or son, a super incorporeal being, that is having the shape and form of a man, but without flesh and blood. This form could only be seen in divine visions and understood in divine revelations. Later on, this self-same spirit manifested himself in a physical body and walked the earth plane as Joshua the Messiah, whom the world calls Jesus Christ. Now there's only one name, <clears throat> excuse me, given unto salvation, and we must know that name. So the simple yet intelligent question we should ask ourselves is, what was the name of the Savior during the time he walked the earth plane? A further understanding of this name and title may be had by reading the preface of a Holy Name Bible. Also in the school, we teach by a divine pattern of the universe. 
It's called a divine pattern because it's Yahweh's pattern. After Yahweh led the children of Israel out of Egypt and into the wilderness of Sinai, he called Moses atop Mount Sinai and showed him this tabernacle pattern in a vision. Yahweh instructed Moses to build one exactly as he had seen it in the wilderness of Sinai. The pattern consists of a most holy place, a holy place, and a court roundabout. These three compartments make up the one tabernacle pattern. Now in the school, we go about to show proof that everything is in the universe is made and operates according to the structure and function of this threefold tabernacle pattern and how that absolutely nothing escapes the pattern. Now in this school, we have 10 primary constitutional aims and objectives and they are as follows. First is to help you find and know Yahweh our Elohim as he really is and actually exists. Second is to form a nucleus of universal brotherhood of humanity in Yahshua the Messiah without the distinction of race, nationality, creed, sex, caste, or color. Third is to investigate the unexplained spirit law or so-called law of nature and the powers latent in man. Fourth is to encourage and promote the study of the scriptures comparative religion, psychology, philosophy, both modern, practical, and occult science. Fifth is to extirpate current superstition, skepticism, and ignorance. Sixth is to learn, know, and understand the operation of Yahweh's eternal purpose through the dispensations and ages. Seventh is to discern and avoid being deceived by Lucifer, the serpent, the devil, the dragon, or Satan and his demons operating the mystery of iniquity on earth through the dispensations of time. Eighth is to earnestly contend for the common salvation and faith, which was once delivered unto the sons or children of Yahweh. Ninth is to make known that Yahweh from the beginning ordained. There is no other name given among men whereby man can be saved, saving the name of Yahshua the Messiah. And tenth, is to inherit eternal life now in the kingdom of Yahshua the Messiah with the hope of a mortal glorification in the new earth state. Our watchword is peace and our slogan is to speak the truth. <clears throat> and this morning we'll have um, the scripture, or I'm sorry, the prayer dedicated by Dr. Frank DeMassey. Then we'll have the scripture, which will be read by Dr. Sharon Welch, which is John, the 12th chapter. You hear me okay? Yes. yes. Good morning, everyone. I'm going to bow your hearts and minds. Get all the thoughts of the flesh out of your head. Get in a special place where you can communicate with your Heavenly Father. Dear Father, we ask that you bless this meeting this morning, that you allow your spirit to flourish through the chosen vessels so that you may get the glory that you so righteously deserve. We ask that each and every one of us realize and appreciate the grace that's been bestowed upon us, that you pulled us out of a world of darkness and you gave us eyes to see and ears to hear and a heart to incorporate your attributes. We ask that we never see a day where each and every one of us never, never love the truth and never love one another. We ask this in Yahshua's name and we all say. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'll be reading John the 12th chapter out of the King James Version inserting the true names. Then Yahshua, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, which had been dead, whom he raised from the dead. There they made him a supper, and Martha served, but Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table with him. Then took Mary a pound of ointment of spikenard, very costly, and anointed the feet of Yahshua, and wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the 
order of ointment. Then saith one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, which should betray him, was why was not this ointment sold for 300 pence and given to the poor? This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the bag and bare what was put therein. Then Yahshua said, let her alone against the day of my bearing hath she kept this. For the poor always ye have with you, but me you have not always. Much people of the Jews therefore knew that he was there, and they came not for Yahshua's sake only, but that they might see Lazarus also, whom he had raised from the dead. But the chief priest consulted that they might put Lazarus also to death, because that by reason of him, many of the Jews went away and believed on Yahshua. On the next day, much people that were come to the feast, when they heard that Yahshua was coming to Jerusalem, took branches of palm trees and went forth to meet him and cried, Hosanna, blessed is the king of Israel that cometh in the name of Yahweh. And Yahshua, when he had found a young ass, sat thereon, as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, thy king, king cometh, sitting on an ass's colt. These things understand not his disciples at the first. But when Yahshua was glorified, then remembered they that these things were written of him, and that they had done things unto him. The people, therefore, that was with him, when he called Lazarus out of his grave and raised him from the dead, bore record. For this cause the people also met him, for that they heard that he had done this miracle. The Pharisees, therefore, said among themselves, Perceive ye how ye prevailed nothing. Behold, the world is gone after him. And there was a certain Greeks among them that came up to worship at the feast. The same came therefore to Philip, which was of Bethsaida of Galilee, and desired him, saying, Sir, we would see Yahshua. Philip cometh and telleth Andrew, and again Andrew and Philip tell Yahshua. And Yahshua answered them, saying, The hour is come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. He that loveth his life shall lose it, and he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal. If any man serve me, let him follow me, and where I am shall also my servant be. If any man serve me, him will my father honor. Now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this cause came I unto this hour. Father, glorify thy name. Then came there a voice from heaven, saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. The people, therefore, that stood by and heard it, said that it thundered. Others said, an angel spake to him. Yahshua answered and said, This voice came not because of me, but for your sakes. <clears throat> now is the judgment of this world, now shall the prince of this world be cast out? And if I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. This he said, signifying what death he should die. The people answered him, we have heard of the law that the Messiah abideth forever. And how sayest thou, the son of man must be lifted up? Who is the son of man? Then Yahshua said unto them, yet a little while, is the light with you. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness come upon you. For he that walketh in darkness knoweth not whither he goeth. While you have light, believe in the light, that you may be the children of light. These things spake Yahshua and departed and did hide himself from them.
but though he had done so many miracles before them, yet they believed not on him, that the saying of Isaiah, the prophet, <clears throat> might be fulfilled, which he spoke, Master, who had believed our report, and to whom had the arm of Yahweh been revealed? Therefore they could not believe, because that Isaiah said again, he that blindeth their eyes and hardened their hearts, that they should not see with their eyes, nor understand with their hearts, and be converted, and I should heal them. These things saith Isaiah when he saw his glory and spoke of him. Nevertheless, among the chief rulers also many believed on him. But because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue. For they loved the praise of men more than the praise of Yahweh. <clears throat> Yahshua crieth and said, He that believeth on me, believeth not on me, but on him that sent me. And he that seeth me, seeth him that sent me. I am come a light into the world, that whosoever believeth on me should not abide in darkness. And if any man hear my words and believe not, I judge him not, for I came not to judge the world, but to save the world. He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judges him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. For I have not spoken of myself, but the Father which sent me. He gave me a commandment, which I should say, and what I should speak. And now that his commandment is life everlasting. <laughs> Whatsoever I speak, therefore, even as the Father said unto me, so I speak. John, the 12th chapter. Thank you, Frank, and thank you, Sharon. We will have a three-speaker format today. And for our first speaker, I'd like to introduce Dr. Lionel Van Manju. Well, good morning, Ithaca and folks around the world. I see there's a bit of Wisconsin out there, a bit of Florida out there, and a bit of Ohio and elsewhere. And of course, the one of the beautiful things with this format is that this is recorded and will be played on YouTube later, I would imagine. And therefore, someone else may come across this in their travels. And that's a beautiful thing because it's another witness and testimony of the gospel of Yahshua the Messiah. And uh, that's such an important thing to hang on to. And uh, anyway, I, I'll give a brief testimony and we'll see how that goes. This morning, uh, uh, the Dean of the Hamilton class and the president of the Canadian schools, Dr. Rod Chandler passed away. He was dealing with uh, various medical issues at the age of 85 and uh, his time was uh, time to uh, come out of the flesh as it were. And uh, as much as I love the man, I respect the spirit that operated in him so much more than the physical entity. As a five-year-old boy, well, my, my parents remember seeing an ad in the Toronto Star in 1972 for a Bible study class. And my dad went to the YMCA on, Ger uh, I think it's Ger Gerard Street in Toronto and walked in and saw the elementary chart. And he was about to bolt after about five minutes. Oh, man, <laughs> Bible story, Bible story. <laughs> it's not what he was looking for. He'd be looking for all kinds of stuff. But but he stayed and Billy Carroll and Rod Channer there and labored and explained to him and and as a okay. grateful recipient of being in my father's household, uh, you know, remember listening to Bible stories at the bedtime, you know, before I go to bed about Samson and Moses and all these stories and, and coming to class and seeing Rod Chandler from when I was five years old. And man, I look up, that guy was one tall, big Jamaican dude. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yep. And, and as a 54 year old man, he still is a big, tall Jamaican dude, although he shrunk and I grew. Um, <laughs> it's, uh, very grateful that uh, the things that he had received, he continued to preach and hang on to. And some of the classes experienced the split where people went go went off chasing uh, a physical leader or chasing the newest thing or some other wind of doctrine. Uh, Dr. Channer endured the split with three of his sisters, two of his sisters departing and his nephew departing and a whole bunch of other members from Hamilton to go start another class elsewhere in Canada. And um, 
-hmm. And he would lay around with a small group of people and it wouldn't be uncommon for you to go by the class on a Thursday night when we had classes then or a Friday night and, and see him by himself in the class, the lights on, reading out of the Bible and uh, mm -hmm. by himself or with, with multitude of people, it didn't matter. He would carry on do the same thing. I'm sure he's doing the same thing this morning. Mm -hmm. um, and that is a constant reminder to with every breath in your body to continue to preach the gospel of the Ash, the Messiah. And, right. and to be un, unwavering in that is so important. Um, we'll, we'll probably touch on a couple of things in the scripture lesson, but let's go to Romans, the first chapter. And from, from my personal journey, not that that accounts to amounts to anything really. I, I remember when I went to class as a kid, teenager, college, whatever else, college, university, got busy trying to, establish a, a life or a career or whatever I thought life was and I didn't go to class for a while when I resurfaced back at class I walked in the door and there's Rod Channer kind of quietly in a very subtle way smiling and other people are coming over to me like I'm a, I'm a first-time visitor and um, he was waving them off he was waving them off and um, but I was so refreshed to hear the same things that I was hearing when I was a kid growing up and an adolescent and a teenager and young adult that I heard when I came back as a whatever year I was, 30-something-year-old man and so forth, to hear the same stories back and forth. And it wasn't grievous for me to hear those stories. So let's go to Philippians 3 and 1. I think that's where that is. And then we'll also go to Romans the fourth, uh, Romans 1 and 14, I think. Uh, Philippians 3 and 1. 3 and 1. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in Yahweh. To write the same thing to you, to me, indeed, is not grievous, but for you, it is safe. Now, these are letters written to those sons in Yahweh, you know, in Yahshua the Messiah, and not to the all the people in, in the Philippian area or the Philippi or wherever the area specifically is. That's a different class on geography. But his, he's preaching the same thing to those people as a reminder to turn back and go back and focus on the things that... Yahshua had taught through the Holy Spirit as poured out on the day of Pentecost. And those things he poured out, he said, you know, remember these words that I spoke when I was yet with you in, in Luke 24th chapter, right? He's bringing them back so that when he was walking around them, you know, they didn't get it, mm -hmm. you know, but, but he was still preaching to them and, and he wasn't preaching, Hey, go, go, go and get baptized. No, you go out and have suppers. No, that he was fulfilling those things. The, for, so for Saul or Paul to write the same things here unto this, the, that assembly isn't grievous. His goal isn't to write some new of, new epistle of what thus saith Paul or Saul. He's preaching those same things. It's not grievous. It is safe, right? right. <laughs> you don't want to be tossed. It's like a foundation of a house. And, you know, you don't want to all of a sudden build onto that house and not have it line up with the foundation or not follow the building code or the the law and the prophets, as it were, and those things that are required and those witnesses. It has to follow up properly. Otherwise, that house or building or whatever structure is going to come down at the first sign of trouble, wind or earthquake or house party. You know, you know it's going to happen. Mm -hmm. Verse 2. Beware of dogs. Beware of evil workers. Beware of the concision. For we are the circumcision which worship Elohim in spirit and rejoice in Yahshua the Messiah and have no confidence in the flesh. Now, although Saul was circumcised on the eighth day, and you can read about that, there was none finer and, and all those folks uh, of, of all those folks and so forth. That circumcision, that cutting away isn't so much of the flesh anymore as the Gentiles were brought in. But it's that circumcision of the heart and mind that's done not with hands. Who does that? That Holy Spirit that can separate the joints and, and, the, and the marrow that you can read about in Hebrews 4 and 12, I believe it is, that who can separate and knoweth your, your thoughts and intentions. It's that circumcision. You know, to have no confidence in the flesh, right? And, and you can read about that as you read down further where it says in the fifth verse that he was circumcised on the eighth day. But I'm... I'm just saying it's the same thing as much as you tune in some of these Zoom classes if you are surfing the internet, for example, because this is for us, the people in the Zoom room or those watching, but also those that may have no understanding of this class and may be curious that it's so important to check these things out and look at the charts and look at the definitions on the charts because they're so important for your edification and your 
awareness. Not that you can do anything of yourself, but you still have to check these things out. You can't sit back in the lazy boy chair and, and have your coffee and do nothing. You still need to investigate, but it's the spirit that's going to provide that increase, right? It's all watered, Apollo's planted, uh, the other way around. Apollo's watered and Saul planted, but who provided the increase? Not oh, Saul or Apollo's. It was Yahweh that provided the increase. They were just laborers together, but it's all Yahweh's garden, his creation. He's working his will. So if you put up the, the, the 40 foot chart for just the overview for a second, there you go. It's uh, the divine pattern, man, you know, existence of Yahweh through dispensations and ages. It's this is these are all these witnesses that are pointing out Yahweh's purpose and plan, and that He's setting it up so that we are without an excuse for not recognizing Yahweh Elohim in Yahshua, which you can read at the witness chart at the bottom. Well, let's go to uh, Romans uh, uh, first chapter and verse uh, fifteen. Romans 1 15 <clears throat> so as much as in me is I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also so that's, I am that's more than just whatever awareness that he may have as a human being or an individual that's more than just you know the fact he had his Weetabix and a coffee or in the morning and he's going to give what he has that's all that in him is and what is all that in him is not Saul, it's that Holy Spirit of Yahshua Messiah manifested in him that's preaching the gospel. Right. He is a changed entity, and you can read about that in the fourth chapter of Ephesians, where he's a prisoner unto Yahweh. He's a prisoner. Yeah, he was in jail by man and shipwrecked mm -hmm. by man, you know, by various different vices and led out of prison and beaten by man and all those different things. But he was a prisoner of Yahweh, and, and that prisonership is, is you know, his, his vocation to preach and dispense all those things that he received. And that's the admonishment that's given out to all of the, the members of the various schools and so forth, you know, um, to preach all that in you is. It's like a pro athlete. And, you know, uh, you want to leave everything you have on the field during your opportunity to play because your career is physically finite, um, that you don't want to finish the game and think man I, I had more to give you know you 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 want to give it all and it's not about what's in your wallet at all that's why we tell you to come back to class it's not so they come back to class a couple more times so all of a sudden you get an email asking for money no it's it's we want you to come to class because there's things that you and I need to learn and I'm still a student in this gospel and grateful for all of those things that have been brought to my attention and you know when I when I think about it some folks could say that, you know, the, the, the class up here is really, really small and obviously not much smaller today. Um, and one could say, well, why did you bother? From 68 till now, there's like, well, how come you don't have 50, 60, 100 people, thousands of people? Why aren't you filling an arena? No, mm -hmm. because that impact through that gospel being preached is the founder had sent Dr. Uh, Billy Carroll to Montreal from, uh, sorry, sent Billy Carroll from California to Hamilton, Canada, and was preaching in a, in a black church. I'll put, just put it that way, because that's the way Rod would describe it, where Rod was going, because his nephew or cousin or, or brother was a minister there. And, and Rod, you know, being a carpenter, and he wasn't into like drinking and darts and bowling and stuff like that. After his swing the hammer, he would go sit in the church, because that gave him comfort even then. But, but and then after the church session would end, they would roll out the charts in the church, and Billy Carroll would give a discourse and Rob would stick around. Where else is he going to go, right? It mm. <laughs> wasn't bingo night in Hamilton. It was, you know, he was going to stay. Okay. <laughs> he stayed and listened. And, and lo and behold, the scripture came up. Uh, we'll jump there for a second. Uh, Matthew, the 16th chapter, and maybe started verse 20. Matthew 16, 20. Yep. Then charged he his disciples if they should tell no man that he was the Messiah. That's right. Well, let's, let's do this. Let's go up a little bit further. Thanks. Um, go to 15. Verse 15. Or I'm, I'm sorry. I'm being a fool. Let's go to 13. Sorry. Okay. Then when Joshua came into the coast of Caesarea, Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I the son of man am. And they said, some say that thou art John the Baptist. 
some Elias, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. Yeah, that's who the people, who, who do the people, who does the general population say that he is, right? And they're saying all the lists ran down the whole list of other characters, other other vessels, other other important folks in the ministry of Yahshua, all other other vessels in Yahweh's purpose and plan. Okay, fifteen. He saith unto them, "But whom say ye that I am?" Who? How are they going to know? Right? They didn't have the Holy Spirit. They're following Yahshua Messiah. Where else are they going to go? And and John one and fifty nine, and Philip findeth Nathaniel. That's the one you know. We found the one that was spoken about in the Law and the Prophets, right? That's the new snippets of things, but they didn't have all the pieces to the puzzle. It wasn't up for them to fit, put the puzzle together. It was up to Yahweh to give them the piece of the puzzle and for Yahshua to provide that increase on the day of Pentecost. But all before that, he's setting the stage for what's got to happen, okay? And 16? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art Yahshua, the son of the living Elohim. Yeah, Simon Peter says, well, how would he know that, right? That great controversy. Okay, read on. And Yahshua answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. Wow, so is this indicating that Peter had some special vision? You know, this this is starting the, con starting the uh, conflict or dispute that took place in the church that Rod and Billy were in. And Billy was pointing out here to the minister, who was Rod's brother or nephew or uncle, something, a family member of some sort. Okay, uh, jump down to uh, uh, 21. From that time forth began Yahshua to show unto his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and the chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. So when you get over to Luke 24 chapter, when Cleopas and, and the other gentlemen are walking the road to Amos and, you know, Yahshua saying, hey, you fools and slow heart, right? They're recounting. Didn't Yahshua say that these things are going to happen, right? He tells you what's going to happen before it happens. And when it happens, unless you're illuminated with the Holy Spirit, you're not going to recognize what's taking place, right? Now, they weren't at that time. But, you know, he's telling, he's telling, setting the stage all along the line. So when it happens, you know, it's not a surprise. Just like with the sacrifices, you know, yeah, we set up a tabernacle in the wilderness. And uh, you can go to the Moses chart if you're not already up on it. And, and you know, to build that tabernacle in the wilderness and offer sacrifices and so on. But when you read in Isaiah, yeah, we didn't desire those sacrifices, but they were still in play for that time to complete out that age. You know, until the time the Ashram Messiah is coming on the on the scene to be that ultimate sacrifice. Okay, that he's telling you what's going to happen before it's happening. Okay, and so he, he's telling me he had to need to be going to Jerusalem, suffer and, and die and be killed, raised again the third day. Right. And he's told them before when they came to the Ashram Messiah. At the beginning of that 16th chapter, they're looking for a sign. Now, all man's looking for a sign, but they're not looking for the reality of what it is, you know. And the sign of Jonah was given unto the people. And you know what? What was the sign of Jonah? He was he was, you know, in that in that specially prepared fish or whale. He was in he was you know buried as it were inside that uh, that that uh, the creature for three days. Right. That's the sign. The Ashton Messiah is again going to be buried and swallowed up in earth for three days and to complete what was written to fulfill what was written beforehand mm -hmm. okay uh, verse uh, 22 then peter took him and began to rebuke him saying be it far from thee yashua this shall not be unto thee and yep. he yeah yeah he's saying oh that's not gonna be so right right read on but he turned and said unto peter get thee behind me satan thou art an offense unto me for thou savorest not the things that be of yahweh but those that be of men. So the big debate in that church in Hamilton came down to, hey, who, what, what was in Peter, right? The minister there wasn't going to accept that Satan was in Peter because that was going to, that's the church is built on Peter. Many churches are the Roman Catholic church. And, and Billy Carroll was adamant in explaining, listen, that satanic spirit was in Peter at that time. And when Peter was going to be converted, he was told what? Strengthen the brethren, right? That, that spirit was in Peter at that time. That's how he would know you know, who Yahshua the Messiah was, right? Because he learned it from the Father. From that moment in time, uh, Billy Carroll was kicked out of that church. <laughs> and, I'm very, and I'm very grateful that Rod Channer followed him and, and labored on uh, from 1968 until today. And uh, even though we're a small group of people here, 
we'll carry on to the last person standing. And the impact that people have, I, I recall, you know, and it's not to glorify Rod, he would go on weekends to go visit Rochester one night, Syracuse the next night, Elmira, Binghamton the next day on a weekend, right? Do the, in the early 70s, go to through all those classes. And it wasn't preaching himself, it's just learn and support and encourage. It's the same thing we're doing here. You got people jumping on this Zoom class from various places to do what? To support, to be edified, to uplift, to learn, right? All of those things. And, you know, and through that, through my father, who learned a lot from Billy and obviously from Rod, because, you know, my, my, it would be very often that Rod, my dad would be the middle speaker and Rod would be the wrap up speaker and, and take, bring it on home. And, and through my dad, um, that is really through what he learned through Rod Channer, which the spirit working through Rod, he then went on and then helped bring the Zambian class into being in Kipwe Zambia from bringing James Caballa here. And you think, mm -hmm. well, there's not much of the Hamilton class, but wait, that impact of anyone that learned anything through Rod, through Yashua work through Rod that benefited, that provides impact elsewhere, right? Rhonda Brazil would tell you that Rod Channer during the 75 convention, you know, spent the entire break session with uh, Eugene and uh, Elena Brazil at the ages and dispensations chart. After the class, they had a question, Rod spent the time, explained it, and that was impactful for Eugene because that became something that was a specialty or an area of focus that he really enjoyed working with. And that's mm -hmm. how you give of that seed or that energy that's given of yourself or through yourself that gives to other people that causes that increase elsewhere. You know, last week on the Sunday international class that David does, the, the Zambian class did the song, a bunch of songs. They give the lecture, the moderation, everything. It's like, well, that class is still kicking around and it was left for dead for a while, not blaming anybody, but they're still rolling along that you always, you know, and you think of these classes that, um, you know, Clifford in Malaysia and Rita in Accra, Ghana and, and, and Sybil in the Bahamas and George Light, who's in Belleville, Canada. You know, these folks mm -hmm. uh, are really edified and uplifted and kept in the gospel. And, and, and plus, let alone all the other people that are out there. Mm -hmm. And and that's that's why you kind of keep laboring on. Let's go to Second Timothy, the, the second chapter, please. And verse, verse one, and I'll wrap it up shortly here. Second Timothy two and what verse? Uh, one, sure, let's do Oh, that. one, okay. Yep. Second Timothy two and one, but there was false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who uh, privately shall- Is that second Timothy two and uh, second oh, Timothy? Oh, I'm sorry. I That's thought okay. you said Peter. No, well, Peter's always good too, but we'll go with second the second Timothy two. Yeah. Two. Second Timothy two, right? Yes, please. Though so, therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Yahshua the Messiah. Yeah. Now, be strong in that grace. Well, it's hard to be, you know, you be strong. Whatever you've received, grace is unmerited favor, right? You got to be strong in something that. You don't be strong in what you've learned yourself because you haven't learned it of yourself. But through his grace, be strong mm -hmm. in that grace. And whatever you've received, whatever grace and mercy, be grateful, be strong in that, be confident, be assured, be refreshed in that, right? Be mm -hmm. strong in that. Read on. And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Yeah. And whatever you learn about Saul, he is what? It's not about propping him up as the fifth fullness or whatever you want to. No, mm, it's, right. it's that him as a vessel that Yah, Yahweh's working through him to demonstrate the example of metamorphosis and change, just like with the butterfly, where they took him and where he has zeal for Yahweh, but persecuting, uh, upholding the law of Moses. But when the law of Moses was fulfilled by Yahshua, then he had that same zeal to persecute the assembly of Yahshua the Messiah. And then on the road to Damascus, he was, and, and, he received a divine vision and revelation. He was changed. And now he is, you know, preaching the gospel with all vim and vigor and all that he is and all that in him, all that in him is, because that's all that he can do is preach strongly, right? That that's a testimony, a witness. And look at all the books that he had written. It's not about him, but the spirit through him has given us that edification mm -hmm. through what he has written and to point out and go back and talk about, you know, the circumcision and talk about what was written in Corinthians, where there was in the first Corinthians, the first chapter, verse 10, where he hears there's a division among those sons. And what is he going to do about it? 
turn the other way, he's going to reach out to them and preach the gospel to them and help seek to understand and really explain and point out with witnesses where they need to stay focused on. And that's the same thing we need to do these days is uplift. Hey, if I say something that's off, I expect my phone to ring and someone talk it out with me, please, please. It's crucial because I don't want to be thinking something that's not right. And, and you guys know it or someone else knows it and isn't reaching out to me or vice versa, right? That would be a shame. It's you don't you don't mm-hmm. want to you don't want to walk around walk by someone drowning right like that that Phil Collins song in the air tonight or whatever one of his songs where it's about someone seeing somebody drowning did nothing you you know you don't want to that's a different story but you know you don't want to be uh, you don't want to leave someone behind obviously Yahweh he looks after his for sure but it's also an exercise in, with you and I to teach and be humble and apt to teach with patience which is spoken on later there in the. Uh, uh, in the 24th verse of the same second chapter of second Timothy, but let's go on verse three. Verse three, though therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Yahshua the Messiah, no man that warreth entangled himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. Yeah, don't be entangled in the affairs of this life. And it's, hey, I tell you, even as a Canadian, there's enough things to get excited about when you flip on the news, even in my country or your country or anywhere in the world or politics or sports or economics to get worked up about or about people mm. you care about that aren't in class and you get sucked into that whirlpool. And it's it's like a whirlpool. The closer you get to the edge of that whirlpool, wow, you hear the gurgling sound. And next thing you know, you get sucked into that whirlpool, that black hole, where you're just not gonna come out because you got entangled with the affairs of this world. Because you wanna be one who's pleasing him that chosen him. See, Yahweh had, Yahshua had chosen him to be a soldier, right? I'm right. talking with Saul and all those vessels and, and Dr. Channer and all those that have gone before and some of those other patriarchs and stuff that, you know, that, you know, we all have a length of time here, but he's chosen them. They didn't choose themselves, you know? What what brought Rod Channer from Jamaica to England to Hamilton, Canada, <laughs> you mm-hmm. know, to all these different places or my folks to go to the to in to Toronto from you know 30 40 minutes down the road to go check out Bible study class and all the different things that people do and and all the things that you guys have done and carry on right you know but you don't want to be you want to be that strong warrior of Yahshua the Messiah that soldier that endure that hardness and the hardness is the chastening from the earth plane that people shun you and they they treat you like not so good and um but also some of that hardness also comes from being uh confronted with erroneous doctrine or things that aren't true you know, any, any one of us here that, that, that learned something, the always purpose and plan, you could easily say, well, I learned about the names through so-and-so or through the school or some teachers. And well, the, you know, they taught me the name of Yahweh and Yahshua, that's my salvation. And then you keep following along with those entities or those people along that they went on a detour and you went with them. <coughs> you know, they, their job was, their job was to pull you out as given the spirit was given them to help get you out of that bondage that spiritual bondage and darkness that you're in Mm -hmm. right and they did that and that was their mission but don't follow them you know you follow the spirit which is josh the messiah what about the apostasy plate on the elementary chart please five minutes lionel thanks ma'am got it so you look there in the apostasy plate. What do you got down there? Cardinal Lawrence is restored down there in the in the because uh, this all follows the pattern, right? The outer court or the court roundabout, right? And the holy place area. Well, how could it be? You've got sex, creeds, cults, and 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 the vicar, son of God. There, how what are they doing in the holy place section of that? What are they hmm. doing? There? Well, in John, right, it talks about you know the you know to come into the tabernacle, you come in the holy place, you come in through the door, and the door is Joshua the Messiah, but the, the thief. But others are going to come in through the sheepfold. They're thieves and robbers, right? <laughs> Just like the the seed, the good seed that's sown, right? Is the is the is the kingdom of Yahweh? And then lo and behold, the adversary comes at nighttime and he throws his seed. And they have to grow up together. And the separation from that growing up together is through Yahshua the Messiah, because you see very clearly in the chart, he's the way, the truth, and the life, and takes you through all of that crap that you see in the middle part and the bottom part of that center of your screen that you're looking at he's the way he's the truth it's his purpose he's choosing to do what he wants to do with his creation you know it's 
his world. We're just, if we get to do anything, it's all through his grace and mercy. Nothing woke me up this morning. I didn't do it myself. He caused me to wake up this morning and he caused mm-hmm. me to fall on my face and he caused me to do this and that. And he caused me to cry like a, like a baby earlier and all these things. Mm-hmm. Second Peter uh, one and 12, please. I know my time is almost up. What was that? Sorry, Second Peter one and twelve. Second Peter one and twelve. Wherefore I will not be ne- ne- negligent to put you also in remembrance of these things, though ye know them and be established in the present truth. Remember when we were in Philippians, the third chapter, where where Saul said it's not grievous to say the same thing unto you. Peter is saying the same mm-hmm. thing. It's slightly different words, but the same spirit in Saul is the same one of Peter, the same one as John, the same one as H.C. Kinley, the same one is supposed to be in you. Mm-hmm. They're saying the same thing. He's not going to be negligent to put you always in remembrance of those things, even though you know them. You've got to go back because it's so easy to get that foundation, get too excited, mm-hmm. get off your foundation. And it's a constantly humbling process to come to these classes, myself as well, and listen to folks go over stuff that I maybe heard a long time ago, but I forgot, right? And to be reminded of, and it's like, wow, I missed that. I didn't get it. Praise Joshua that I was shown something. Mm-hmm. 13. 13. Yea, I think it me, as long as I am in this tabernacle, to stir you up by putting you in remembrance. And we're, knowing- in the same, we're sorry, Sharon, we're in the same spot as Peter. That we're still in this tabernacle. Other vessels have come out of their tabernacle and are resting, waiting for the number to be complete, uh, which you can read about in Revelations, third or fourth chapter, second, whatever. But, you know, as long as we're in this tabernacle, while we're stuck in this physical body, and this tab- tabernacle is important because it's a First uh, Corinthians 6, 19. What? Know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? Mm-hmm. That while you're in this tabernacle, it's your indispensable duty to keep these things going and to continue to stir up by putting and bringing people into remembrance those things they've heard and forgotten well as much as dr channer has passed and if people still send cards to his family that's great please do so because his kids or other people may read those cards may have their heart pricked to pay attention to return back and look at those things they may be glossed over I'm saying that generally, I can't speak for where the other people are at, but the, you know, but you never know how that process works. Just like having a Zoom class is in the Zoom class, you do it brought several people into class that are far countries or were in class before that have come back. Okay, uh, 14. Knowing that shortly I must put off this my tabernacle, even as our master Yahshua the Messiah has shown me. Yep, yeah, read on. Moreover, I will endeavor that you may be able, after my decease, to have these things also in remembrance. That's right. When his turns up, he passes the torch to the next, to the next, the last person standing. Like, so like what? Uh, uh, Elijah thought he was alone in Romans 10 and 5. We're not going to go there. I think that's where that is. Where, what? He thought he was all alone. But wait, Yahweh had, Yahweh had reserved, what, 7,000 that had not bowed their knee to Baal? He mm-hmm. wasn't alone. He just thought he was alone. Right. Right. Anyway, we haven't, as it says in the 16th verse, we have not followed cunningly devised fables. We've kept with the witnesses and the truth in this gospel. And we've done a good job to hold each other accountable. And may we continue to do so. I'm looking forward to listening to other speakers. Thank you for the opportunity. Peace and love to all of you. Praise Joshua. Thank you, Dr. Von Manjou. Thank you so much. Um, for our next speaker, I'd like to introduce Dr. Susie Zukowski. Hi, can everybody hear me? Yes. Yeah. Um, interesting following Lionel's testimony and um, the things that he preached. When somebody passes, it causes us to have a lot of memories, I think. Mm -hmm. And um, you think about the things that people have said. Lionel was talking about how um, things that we teach or preach or even just say to somebody in passing is a seed that 
gets thrown out and hopefully planted and takes root. And a lot of times we'll never know the results of those things that happen. Lionel had a specific example um, that he used, but I'm, um, I'm convinced that there's things that we never even know that a seed produced fruit from something that we may have shared with somebody or a way that it was said to somebody, um, you know, caring thoughts, um, thoughtful responses to questions that were asked. And so it's a, um, it's something that should help us to continue on and realize that um, those things are our testimonies and our, um, fruit that follows the things that we have been shown and given and hope to share with others and never give up um, trying to respond as sincerely and as thoughtfully and as thoroughly as we possibly can. And sometimes somebody's passing, Lionel was talking about, um, you know, thoughts to the family. And in this case, Rod's family is in the, um, side of the gospel right now that um, differs from what we understand to be the truth, but you never know what some of those words might mean. And to those that have family or friends that are not in the teaching, um, we so sincerely see that there is life after death and are totally convinced of um, a resurrection um, that that can also influence what other people think when they're not sure whether there's life after death or um, whatever it may be. So um, just thinking from some personal experience and some things that Lionel made me think of in his testimony, um, it, those memories and those words and things are, are an important um, uh, tool, important um, means that Yahweh also uses to, to plant some seeds. The other thing at a time like this, um, and hearing all of Rod's challenges with the physical ailments and things that he had, um, as sad as it is to lose our brethren and our those loved ones in the flesh, we're so much more um, brought to joy by them being able to be released from those the body that may have caused such bondage and limitations and frustrations to people. Right. And we all struggle with, you know, daily things that um, are maybe painful or frustrating or whatever, but we know that um, it's uh, a blessing for them to now be out of the flesh. So that brings joy at a time that can also bring sadness. Um, mm -hmm. I was, I, it brought me back to thinking about some things with Rod and with um, Billy Carroll when I came into class um, in Rochester in the early 70s, um, Rod and Billy um, came down occasionally for visits, Rod in particular, and they were such an unlikely pairing, I must say, of two <laughs> ministers in the gospel. Right. And um, so it, it, Rod had this gentle personality, wonderful smile, um, never um, stopped to want never stopped wanting to teach and to preach the gospel. Um, same thing about Billy's devotion and dedication. However, um, I would always think when Billy was teaching that it, his way of ending his lecture and getting off the floor was kind of like that in the twinkling of an eye, the whole thing's going to end. And he had the most abrupt way of just like finishing saying something you didn't uh -huh. see it coming and all of a sudden he was down off the floor yeah. um and you know so it makes you kind of just appreciate how Yahweh said we're peculiar people and everybody's got their own style and they and you trust that all of those different ways of teaching and preaching that are out there are all Yahweh's way of providing fruit and substance to somebody and it may not be to everybody and it may not, we may not, um, you know, appreciate one speaker's style and approach over another, but hopefully we're able to look past those kinds of things and listen with an ear and an eye of understanding and pass the veil of the flesh to, to 
get the words that are being meant to be given to us as and what Frank was talking about in the prayer. Um, let's go back to the scripture reading, please, to John 12. And um, I'll try to pick up. There were so many things in the scripture reading. And you read something and you think, I don't remember ever reading that before, or I don't remember that particular point being shown in, in what I've read. So um, I'd like to try and work through a few of the things that are in this chapter um, and hopefully be able to bring out some, some thoughts for um, all of us to, to consider in Yahweh's purpose. Um, let's start right at one. John 12 and one. Then Yahshua, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany where Lazarus was, which had been dead, whom he raised from the dead. There they made him a supper, and Martha served, but Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table with him. All right, so I think most everybody's familiar with at least the key points of this story, and the main discussion for this, or the main foundation and information for this, really actually starts in the chapter before this, where um, yeah, Yahshua is told that Lazarus, whom, um, as it's described, whom he loved, um, had died, and um, Yahshua did not rush to where Lazarus had passed away. Um, much to the frustration or the questioning of his disciples who were with him, but eventually went. And then when he did go, he raised Lazarus from the dead. Lazarus had been in the tomb, wrapped up in grave clothes, had been in the tomb for a number of days. And um, Yahshua called him forth. And he came forth and was um, apparently just fine and normal. And here we read that he's sitting at the table with eating supper with them after he had been raised from the dead. Read. Then took Mary a pound of ointment of spikenard, very costly, and anointed the feet of Yahshua, and wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the odor of the ointment. Then, then saith one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, which should betray him, why was not this ointment sold for 300 pence and given to the poor? This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the bag and bear what was put therein. All right. And so then we have a bit of interchange between Judas Iscariot and looking at um, Mary with some very costly ointment who had um, anointed the feet of Yahshua and we got insight into why he asked about not selling the ointment. Why wasn't it sold for the poor? Because that wasn't in his heart. That wasn't his nature. He was asking because he was the one who held the money bag and um, cared about, and it describes him as a thief here. And um, he cared about how much money they had. So um, it's an interesting kind of insight here into Judas Iscariot, who would later be the one that betrayed Yahshua for 30 pieces of silver. Read. Let her alone against the day of my burying has she kept this. For the poor always you have with you, but me you have not always. Read. Much, much people of the Jews, therefore, knew that he was there, and they came not for Yahshua's sake only, but that they might see Lazarus also whom he hath raised from the dead. All right, so we can identify with this discussion. You could bring this up to modern day. And if there was somebody who had been claimed to be raised from the dead and was sitting around having dinner with a group of people, you can bet that there'd be the paparazzi and all of the interested <laughs> public and the people trying to take pictures and wanting to talk or get an autograph or something like that. Um, this is the same kind of, scene that's going on here read but the chief priest consulted that they might put lazarus also to death all right we now how ridiculous is this yashua raised him after he was dead and now the chief priests who are feeling threatened by this whole scene they're talking about well let's see if we can put lazarus to death again uh, what what are they thinking the messiah already brought him back from the dead and they think that to fix the situation they should just kill him again 
it shows you how the natural mind is just not thinking straight. Right. They have a, um, an agenda, they are threatened. And so they come up with this plan, read. Because that by reason of him, many of the Jews went away and believed on Yahshua. On the next day, much people that were coming to the feast, when they heard that Yahshua was coming to Jerusalem, took branches of palm trees and went forth to meet him and cried, Hosanna, blessed is the king of Israel that cometh in the name of Yahweh. And Yahshua, when he had found a young ass, sat thereon, as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, thy king comes sitting on an ass's colt. These things understood not his disciples at the first, but when Yahshua was glorified, then remembered they that these things were written of him and that they had done these things unto him. All right, so um, Yahshua proceeds to do something, to get on a um, young ass and to sit, and all these people are waving palms and things. And um, John points out in his retelling of this that the disciples did not understand why he did this and what he was doing. But when he was glorified, which would be after the fact of his death, burial, and resurrection, um, then remembered they the things that were written of him and that they had done these things unto him. Now let's hold for a moment here. We're going to go back here. But if the other scripture reader could go into um, John, the 14th chapter, and um, j we'll just pick up another um, scripture that this ties in with about things being brought back to their remembrance. We're going to go down to, um, let's see. Let's start at 25. John 14, 25. These things have I spoken unto you, being yet present with you. And he spoke a lot of things to them during the course of the ministry, that three and a half years when they were walking around with him, a scenario of him saying something and them not understanding what he's saying or what he's talking about was pretty common. They, right. He was a mystery to them. And um, it talks about in John, the sixth chapter, when he says something about eating his body and drinking his blood, um, that he's talking about in type, that a lot of people left at that point. And the disciples were still there. And he said to them, aren't you going to go away? Are you going to leave also? And they said to him, where would we go? You, you're, you have these special words. You have something special. They didn't even understand it themselves, but they were drawn and kept there um, by Yahweh. And so despite the fact that they didn't understand a lot of things, they were still following him around because they knew there was something special and they just couldn't leave. So right. here, these things have I spoken to you being yet present with you, a whole nother list of things that he says that they don't understand. Read on. But the comforter, which is the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. All right, so first of all, he talks about a comforter who he explains is the Holy Ghost and whom the Father will send in his name, the name of Yahshua. This comforter is going to teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. Now, as humans, as a mere mortal person, you, unless you, our memories are faulty. We don't remember a lot of things that happen, that people say, that we're told, um, things that we learn and then kind of disappear out of our minds, calling on scriptures, trying to remember where things are. Our, we don't remember a lot of things. And yet what this verse and what Yahshua was telling them is there is going to be something, the Holy Ghost. He's going to teach us all things and bring all things to our remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. So it doesn't necessarily mean he's going to bring back to your remembrance what you had for dessert 10 years ago. But the important things, the things that Yahshua said, the things that we need to remember um, or that were 
um, confusing or mysterious to us at a point in time, those things are going to be brought back to our remembrance and we will get an understanding. More importantly, it's not just we're going to remember the words, but when the Holy Ghost brings things back to remembrance, he um, opens up the door, um, which was um, uh, opened on the day of Pentecost. He opens up that door for us to see and understand, not just remember words, but to understand what Yahshua said and why he said it and what it meant. Have a whole new understanding of um, thinking about the things that he had said unto them. So, um, and c continue reading down in this chapter, if you would. 27, peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. You have heard how I said unto you, I go away and come again unto you. If you loved me, you would rejoice because I said, I go unto the father for my father is greater than I. Now I have told you before it come to pass that when it is come to pass, you might believe. All right. And so here's the other piece of that. I have told you before it come to pass that when it does happen, you might believe. Right. So he's also providing them with something that's going to support and um, develop, help develop their, their belief and their faith in knowing who he was and what was supposed to be happening and why. Um, now, can we go back to um, John 12 and pick up where we left off? Would you tell me what verse that is? It's verse 17. Okay. The people, therefore, that was with him when he called Lazarus out of his grave and raised him from the dead, bear record. All right. And so there were a group of people there that had been first person witnesses, eyewitnesses to Lazarus being called out of the grave, being raised uh -huh. from the dead. And they bore record. They provided testimony. They were witnesses. So there were people that couldn't be dismissed. It wasn't secondhand. It wasn't the story somebody else told. There were eyewitnesses there that bore record to what had happened. Read. For this cause, the people also met him, for that they heard he had done this miracle. The Pharisees therefore said among themselves, Perceive you how ye prevail nothing? Behold, the world is gone after him. All right, and the Pharisees are getting increasingly threatened and nervous and jerky and um, coming up with all of these um, uh, ways to have to deal with this because it's not just their, um, they were the religious leaders of the people and they, their, their positions, their, um, how they were supported from a financial standpoint um, depended on having the people following them, but more importantly to them, their um, position in the people's minds, their um, position of authority, their um, reputations, their egos were all dependent upon them being looked at as the religious authorities of the time and the people that, that should be being followed. And what Yahshua is doing here um, totally threatened the foundation of that, pulled the rug out from underneath them. And um, keep reading. We'll get into that a little bit more with a couple other comments here. Read. And there were certain Greeks among them that came to worship at the feast. The same came therefore to Philip, which was of Bethsaida of Galilee, and desired him, saying, Sir, we would see Yahshua. Philip cometh and telleth Andrew, and again Andrew and Philip tell Yahshua. And Yahshua said, excuse me, and Yahshua answered them, saying, The hour is come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abides alone. But if it die, it bring forth much fruit. He that loveth his life shall lose it. And he that hated his life in this world 
shall keep it unto life eternal. All right. So this goes again from a different manifestation to some of the things that I was already talking about. A corn of wheat falls to the ground. Um, if it stays a corn of wheat and sits on somebody in some farmer's shelf somewhere, it doesn't change. It doesn't accomplish anything. You do, all you have is a corn of wheat. But if it falls into the ground and dies, um, it brings forth much fruit. So seeds need to be planted. Seeds need to be um, tossed into the ground, into what appears to be maybe lifeless dirt, but can come forth and bring much fruit. And that's what our hope is with this teaching. Um, he that loves his life shall lose it. So if somebody wants to maintain their life in this world, they're like a corn of wheat that's sitting on a shelf. And all they are is in a physical body, in a physical um, earth plane, um, in a world that is, um, everything's temporary and everything eventually has um, the end of its life, the end of its existence terminate because it is temporary. But if he um, looks beyond this world, if um, he sees that this is just a type and a shadow on a temporary dwelling place, that eventually he's going to put off his tabernacle as um, that scripture we were reading before talked about. Um, then he's looking beyond this world and beyond this life and looks to the, the life after death, to the resurrection of the spirit and life eternal, as that verse says. He shall keep his life unto life eternal. Keep reading. Verse 26. If any man serve me, let him follow me. And where I am, there shall also my servant be. If any man serve me, him will my father honor. Now is my soul troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this cause came I unto this hour. Father, glorify thy name. Then came there a voice from heaven, saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. The people, therefore, that stood by and heard said that it thundered. Others said, an angel spoke to him. Joshua answered and said, this voice came not because of me, but for your sakes. All right. And so Joshua says, Father, glorify thy name. And before that, he talks about my soul is troubled, save me from this hour, for this cause I came into, um, I came into this hour, and we know that he's fulfilling. Um, I'm not going to detour at the moment, but there's a number of situations um, when he talks about something along this kind of line in the Garden of Gethsemane, um, talking about, um, take this cup from me. Um, Christians, um, religious elders, priests, ministers, um, people read those things and think, was he doubting? Was he um, rethinking what his mission was? Um, and all of that needs to be looked at, knowing that everything that the Messiah was doing, everything that Yahshua was doing was fulfilling what was in the law and the prophets and fulfilling the overall purpose of Yahweh to bring us up until um, uh, the death, burial, resurrection, and um, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. And if it's looked at from an informed standpoint, then you can appreciate that it's not someone um, uh, that's um, desolate or disheartened or whatever. But right now, I'm just going to say that and encourage people that if you haven't seen how the institution in fulfillment, um, how the, what the Messiah came in to do and why, um, talk to us about that because there's a lot that will be very joyful for you to see. Now, Father, glorify thy name. And the voice from heaven um, said, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. So one of the things that the Messiah, that Yahshua was, um, focused on, put his energies into, wanted the people to see, and the voice from heaven confirming it, that the name of the Father, which is Yahweh, is glorified, and it will be glorified again. And 
we we spend time talking about that name because that name is is life giving. That name is both from a natural standpoint because we breathe the name of Yahweh. We breathe that from the moment we come into this creation until the moment we leave this creation, we are glorifying and testifying to the name of Yahweh. But more importantly, it's the name of our heavenly father, our spiritual life, our spiritual breath, our spiritual existence is also dependent upon, linked to, produced by that name of Yahweh. And um a true understanding and a true meditation on it provides um life-giving um illumination and allows us to glorify um that that spiritual source and substance that we come from and the purpose of the father that we are involved in um the people thought an angel spoke to him um, and Yahshua was quick to say that the reason that was done was to provide a witness or to get their attention and to let them know that there's something beyond what he was just saying from a natural standpoint as what they perceived as a man saying it it happened because it was for their sakes so that they could know that there was something special going on with him um, keep reading 31 now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. This he said, signifying what death he should die. The people answered him, We have heard out of the law that Yahshua abides forever. But how sayest thou the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? Then Yahshua said unto them, Yet a little while is the light with you. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness come upon you. For he that walketh in darkness knoweth not whither he goeth. While you have light, believe in the light, that you may be the children of light. And he's, he's talking saying, about himself. They don't understand that. But he also said, I am the light that has come into the world. He was the light they had with them. And um, go ahead. These things spake Yahshua and departed and did hide himself from them. But though he had done so many miracles before them, yet they believed not on him, that the saying of Isaiah the prophet might be fulfilled, which he spake. Yahweh, who hath believed our report, and to whom hath the arm of Yahweh been revealed? Therefore, they could not believe, because that Isaiah said again, he hath blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts, that they should not see with their eyes, nor understand with their heart, and be converted, and I should heal them. These things said Isaiah when he saw his glory and spake of him. Nevertheless, among the chief rulers also many believed on him, but because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him lest they should be put out of the synagogue. For they love the praise of men more than the praise of Yahweh. All right, so this is a very important point that's being made here. It says, nevertheless, among the chief rulers, among the elders, the religious authorities of the day, many believed on him, on Yahshua. But because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue. So they're being, they're afraid of being essentially excommunicated from um, their, their position and their role and the, the people that they, they hang out with and they value their opinion. They love the praise of men more than the praise of Yahweh. Mm -hmm. um, can we go over to John? Um, Wally, you stay where you are, please. I'm still going to go back there. John 5. And down around um, 43. Let's see. Um, I'll also... Take Five a quick minutes. look. Okay, Five thank you. Thank you. Um, my father's name. Yeah, it actually started at 39, if you would, Sharon, please. John 5 39, search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. 
and you will not come to me that you might have life. All right. So he's talking to people following him and included in that would have been some of these people, chief rulers, people that don't want to necessarily say that they're um, following him, but they're interested in hearing what he has to say. And he's telling them, search the scriptures. They're the ones who understand the scriptures, those religious rulers and elders and educated people. The common man didn't necessarily know what was in the scriptures, but he's telling them, search the scriptures. And at the time he's saying this, the gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John were not written. So he's talking about the old, what's in the considered the old Testament of the Bible. You right. think you have eternal life in those. They think that that's where they place their, their um, bet on eternal life, but they are, they, which testify of me. He's telling him the old Testament t is testifying of him and him coming in as the Messiah and the um, only acceptable sacrifice for mankind. Right. And that's where you see the institution and the fulfillment that I was talking about, the things that were written about Yahshua that he had to come in to fulfill. The whole Old Testament is testifying of him, but right. he, they wouldn't come to him that they might have life. Mm -hmm. they, they refused to recognize him or to accept him. Read. I received not honor from men, but I know you, that you have not the love of Yahweh in you. All right. So he points out to them, I received not the honor from men, but I know you, you have not the love of Yahweh in you. He's able to look into their hearts and their minds and he knows what's in there. And he doesn't receive honor from men, but he knows them that they don't have the love of Yahweh in them. Read. I come in my father's name and you receive me not. If another shall come in his own name, him you will receive. All right. And he comes in his father's name so that his father's name could be glorified. And they do receive somebody who doesn't come in the father's name. They don't receive him, but they receive others. Right. Read. How can you believe which receive honor one of another and seek not the honor that cometh from Yahweh only? All right. And he's pointing out to them. They care about what one another thinks. They right. care about the honor of men, as we sometimes have talked about. The honor of men is the currency of the carnal mind. <clears throat> the, the carnal mind cares about what other people think, cares about what somebody does for you and you reciprocate, and cares about how you keep that balance sheet even in, in the worldly types of things. But they cared about what the others thought but not about what Yahweh thought and so right. he was saying I I know what's in you and it comes back to this where we're reading in John they many believed on him or at least thought he was somebody special but if they truly believed and they truly recognized that then they wouldn't have cared that they might be tossed out of the synagogue that they might be quote excommunicated but they loved the praise of men, the honor of men, more than the praise of, of Elohim. Right. Now, um, let me kind of wind down there. Um, there's um, a scripture. Let me see if I can tell you what it is that I. Um, there's um, the scripture that talks about um, what can we do to do the works of the father um does anybody john, to... john 6 28 okay thanks sasha let's um go there for a moment so that i can wind down on the thought that i'm trying to express here 628 all right wait wally wait a minute let me um if you don't mind let me just see if that's Um, let's start at 26. Verse 26. Joshua answered them and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, you seek me not because you saw the miracles, but because you did eat of the loaves and were filled. All right. And this is after the miracle of the fishes and the loaves being multiplied to feed thousands. Read. Labor not for the meat which perishes 
but for that meat which endureth unto everlasting life. Which All right, so he says to them, don't work for the meat which perishes, in other words, the bread and the fishes that you got fed, but for the meat that endureth unto everlasting life, for some substance that allows for everlasting life. Read. Which the Son of Man shall give unto you, for him hath Yahweh the Father sealed. Then said they unto him, what shall we do that we might work the works of Elohim? All right. So coming out of what he said to them, their question then somewhat logically is, well, what should we do to work those works, to labor for the meat that um, provides everlasting life? Read. Joshua answered and said unto them, this is the work of Yahweh, that you believe on him whom he has sent. They said Read. therefore unto him, What sign showest thou then that we may see and believe thee? What dost thou work? All right. And so coming out of that, he says, This is the work of Yahweh, that you might believe on him whom he has sent. He's talking about himself. And then so then their question is, Well, what sign are you going to show us that we can believe? What are you going to work? And he goes into a discussion about how Yahweh gave them manna and fed them in the wilderness and talks about various signs um, that their forefathers didn't believe. Um, if you read back about what Yahweh did, opened the Red Sea, um, provided water out of a rock, rained manna down from heaven. Um, uh, their shoes didn't wear out for 40 years. Uh, you just read sign after sign, work after work, and these people have no different mindset than their forefathers did when they didn't believe Yahweh. Every time a new thing came up, every time a new sign was given, it didn't cause them to believe. There was not a heart in them or a mind in them to believe and know Yahweh. So um, the important thing coming out of all of that is all of this was brought up through the time of the Messiah's death, burial, and resurrection. He did everything he did to fulfill, to finish the works that the father gave him. That's um, talked about in John 17. And once those works were done and once that whole purpose or effort was fulfilled that he was supposed to be doing, he brought in um, the uh, poured out the Holy Spirit, the comforter that was talked about in John 14 that was poured out on the day of Pentecost given to those that were to receive it and then belief true belief based on understanding um was was able to happen and was given to us so that we could then see um uh, what he did and um the ability to have life everlasting life after death um to have all things brought back to our remembrance and then um, opened up, glorified, and the ability to follow um, truly um, not caring about the honor of men and looking for that day um, when we would be able to see, again, kind of going back to the memories at the beginning of this, that we would be able to see without the limitations of the physical body, the natural eyes that don't always work, the ears that can't always hear, why we have hearing aids, why we have glasses. Um, we can go beyond that and truly be in um, a new existence in the light that Yahshua talked about. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Susie. <clears throat> For our next speaker, I'd like to introduce Dr. Gregory. <laughs> Oh, sorry, Pam, your voice was garbled here. Um, did you call me? I did. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's okay. Um, well, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Appreciate this opportunity, although I, I am a bit surprised. And we really appreciate everybody coming in and uh, visiting us on these Sunday classes. Um, when we had a physical class, there's just very few people. So um, it's really wonderful that everyone thinks to come join us on these Sundays. So a lot's been brought up 
Uh, there are a lot of things to work with. Uh, I think what I want to do is try to go back and pick up something Lionel was working with and then see if I can work it forward, pick up some of the things that uh, Sue talked about. <clears throat> and um, by then we'll be out of time, I suspect. So could we go back to Second Peter? Uh, and I think it was around one and 12. Second Peter one twelve. Wherefore I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though you know them and be established in the present truth. Yea, I think it meet as long as I am in this tabernacle to stir you up by putting you in remembrance, knowing that shortly I must put off this my tabernacle even as our master Yahshua the Messiah has shown me. Okay, so um, ho hold it there. I want to go a little bit further. Um, as Lionel talked about, and as Susie mentioned, um, when someone that we know passes, uh, either in or out of the teaching, um, it generally just causes us to reflect a bit on um, mortality in general and our own mortality and the fact that this life that uh, Yahweh has given us, as far as we understand it in our existence in the physical creation goes, is a temporary affair. Now, um, you know, really, uh, we find out that goes all the way back to Adam and that when Adam obeyed the commandment, Yahweh waited till the cool of the day uh, so that the earth plane was going into darkness. And that reflected the darkness that had entered Adam's heart due to disobedience or because of the condemnation that was due to disobedience. And he was cast out into this earth plane, and um, Yahweh proclaimed that uh, he would uh, he would die. And you know, one of the things Dr. Kinley talks about is somebody coming along saying, um, "Well, I don't believe there's a God. I don't believe in the Bible." Um, well, what are you doing dying? Why are you dying then if you don't believe? And so we come to realize that um, we have our life uh, from Yahweh and that it um, that physical life is limited. Now, um, Peter is reflecting on this here. Uh, you know, he says here, knowing shortly that I put off, I must put off this my tabernacle. And we've already talked a little bit today how um, our body, uh, when we look at the, the, the divine metaphysical teaching that's embedded in the Bible, we find out that this tabernacle that Yahweh had Moses build in the wilderness so that he could dwell <laughs> among them. Somebody's uh, mic is it's on. Okay, it's okay. Look, when that happens, I'll take care of it. We don't, um, so I already took care of it, Sharon. Thank you. Now, uh, where was I? So this tabernacle that was built here in the wilderness reflects the human body. And so uh, one of the things Peter's going to get into a little bit further here that I do want to touch on is that we have not followed cunningly devised fables. So anyone can come along and say anything. Um, and, and generally, we encourage you to investigate and to listen to anything. But we need to learn to understand how to um, 
recognize what's true and, and what's false. And indeed, um, in our current political environment, in the current um, situation with the pandemic, um, that's being emphasized. And there, there's a lot of charges of false information and misleading information. And so how do you know what's true? How can you know what's true? Um, is there value in knowing what's true? All of these questions are being uh, put in front of us uh, just, just in terms of, of the current events. So now, uh, I'm sorry, I'm just gonna take this real slow and we're gonna run out of time be before we know it. But um, pick it up at 12 again. 12? Yes, please. Wherefore, I will not be ne ne negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things. Now, see, that's the purpose of these classes. Uh, you know, when you listen to Dr. Kinley's lecture, he always went through, um, he would provide scriptural foundation for the things he was teaching, as well as uh, seasoning those things with various connections that it's really almost impossible to make from a natural standpoint. But as you come to an understanding of the spiritual picture and the operation of Yahweh's spiritual purpose, uh, we do start to see how all these things are interwoven and in interconnected. But the purpose of these classes is to bring these things and put us always in the remembrance of this teaching that Dr. Kinley brought us. And, you know, there's so much, um, so many connections, like I say, that it's always a danger to go off into various ramifications. And I'm trying to sort of stay on the thread here. But it is um, one of the things the Messiah said was that you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free or the truth shall make you free or the truth shall liberate you or the truth shall save you. And Peter here is saying, um, go ahead, read 12 one more time. I'll let you get through the whole sentence and then we'll, we'll move on. Okay. Second Peter 1 and 12. Wherefore, I will not be neg negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though ye know them and be established in the present truth. So you see that, you know, this was written, I don't know exactly, I mean, 60, 50, 60 AD, every Peter died, I think, or in the mid 60 AD. But this is as true then uh, as it is for us now. We want to remember these things. We want to remember the essence of this teaching. And we want to be established in the present truth. And that's the other point is that this is present tense. Um, I think Sue brought out the fact that um, we're all breathing. And if you just take a step back and listen, or if you look at the situation, that breath uh, is a gift. And we breathe the name Yahweh. Um, when you inhale, there's a certain sound. When you exhale, a certain sound. And those sounds are different. There's an in and an out sound. And when you're alone and by yourself, uh, if you just listen to your breathing, you can realize that that's Yahweh is with you in terms of your breath. And mm -hmm. Peter, uh, Paul says in 17 that he giveth to all life and breath and all things. So everything we have in this creation, even from a physical standpoint, is a gift. And we would like to establish an attitude of thankfulness rather than uh, arrogance and combativeness and, and everything else. Now, um, in the interest of time, which is fast fleeting, um, skip down to 16. For 16. For we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our master Yahshua the Messiah, 
but were eyewitnesses of his ma majesty. So see, Peter is telling us there, and as he's already said, he wants us to be established in this and to remember this. And it's just struck me today how current it is, because this is really the essence of why we have these classes and many of us keep coming to these classes. It's not because of it's, it's an ordinance and we're trying to earn our place in heaven or anything like that. It's because we appreciate Yahweh revealing himself to us and teaching and showing us the operation, his existence and the operation of, of his purpose. And this teaching and the things that have already been shared with us today and the things that Dr. Kinley taught um, this is not just some man's interpretation. This is not some cunning fable where we take a verse here and a verse here, there, and put it together and try to create some scenario in order to get you to go along with us and give us some money and so on and so forth. Our, our interest is the facts and the truth. And while it's contrary to the way the world thinks that you can actually know the facts concerning the existence of a creator and know the truth concerning his purpose, it's our contention, and uh, we got that from our founder, it was his contention, that Yahweh showed him by vision and revelation how the scriptures and the very structure and function of the universe itself witness to both the existence of Yahweh and to the operation of his purpose. Um, a little bit more here. Re I'll reread 16 and go to 17. But we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming, coming of our master, Yahshua, the Messiah, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he now received... you see Peter, James, John, we, read, we were reading John today. Um, they were with Yahshua. They knew him as a man. They walked with him. They saw the things that he did. They wondered about the things that he said. And they saw his majesty. And they were very sorrowful when he was... Uh, captured by the, the rulers of the day and crucified, and they were overjoyed when he appeared to them um, during his resurrection. And then on the day of Pentecost, when um, the promise that he had made them of returning to them, uh, which we were reading about in John 14, the, the comforter, which is the Holy Spirit, um, he fulfilled that promise to them on the day of Pentecost. And then Peter received the understanding of all those things that he witnessed. And uh, here he is coming down to the end where he says he must shortly put off his tabernacle, recounting his experiences. And it was Dr. Kinley's contention that he talked with God, that he was shown how these things operate. Now, just for an example, um, the world teaches pretty much that Jesus Christ came in to institute a new form of religious worship. And they have water baptism in that worship and they have Lord's suppers in that worship and so on and so forth. But we go, and, and again, we all learned all of this from Dr. Kinley, you go into the scriptures, Luke 24, uh, Matthew, I think, 517, and we find out that the Messiah himself said that he was come to fulfill. Now, you tell someone that, that he didn't come to institute, he came to fulfill, and they may not want to accept that. And they may think that that's a cunningly devised fable and that we're trying to distort the scriptures in order to gain followers and so on and so forth. And again, like I say, in this present day, 
misinformation, false information, misleading information is very much a factor. We're just inundated with social media posts and various opinions that people have. And it's very difficult to come to a knowledge and an understanding and a conviction of what's true and what's false in almost any realm. Now, um, let, let, let's get it. Let's get uh, Luke 24, 44, I think it is. Just, and this, I just wanna, this is just an example. This is in the Bible and you may not understand it. You may not agree with it. You may not like it, but it is a fact that this statement we're about to read, which is uh, reported of by Yahshua in his resurrection when he was appearing to the disciples, that he said this. This is in your Bible. That's a fact. Read, please. Luke 24, 44. And he said unto them, these are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you. Now, that you happened. see, this isn't the only time he said this. And we um, show, and Dr. Kinley showed us how he said this repeatedly throughout his ministry, starting when he was baptized unto John. He told John, suffer to be so, because it, thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. And the word mm -hmm. fulfill is the exact opposite of institute. So saying that Yahshua came in to institute a physical religion, a physical form of worship, that's the cunningly devised fable. That's sure. been taken from bits and pieces of uh, the things that are written in what's called the New Testament, but which is literally the uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is the biography of the Messiah. Acts is the history of what took place after his death, burial, and resurrection. And then the epistles are the writings of the apostles to the various assemblies of those days. So um, let's get uh, fi finish this here. These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. Who now, you see, that was his story to John. One man, he talked to John when he was baptized. That was his story uh, when he spoke to the multitudes and uh, this is his story, even after his death, burial, resurrection, he's sticking to his story that he came in to fulfill, to accomplish, to complete the things that were written in the law and in the prophets so that he could fulfill the promise that he had made to Abraham, that in his seed, Yahshua, all nations of the earth would be blessed spiritually. And that's where the world gets confused. And that's where these cunningly devised fables come in because they um, miss the point that Yahshua's presence in the flesh, this was the word of Yahweh, Yahweh Elohim incarnate in this physical body. And that was the culmination of the physical significance and of the physical covenant. And um, just as Noah moved, Yahweh used Noah to close the antediluvian age and open the post-diluvian age, wherein he gave Moses the law and the prophets, he came in himself as Yahshua the Messiah, closed the post-diluvian age and opened this present kingdom age, which is um, the spiritual kingdom on earth. And everything past the cross is spiritual. Um, this, the spiritual significance of all the things that were done in the post-Diluvian age is what's active here in this present kingdom age. And that's why with the Jews, he made an old covenant. Um, he made a, a covenant. And then when he comes in and fulfills it, it makes it to be old. And he brings in the new covenant, which is his spirit in the heart and in the mind. 
Now, you see, that might sound like a cunningly devised fable, but in actual fact, it's borne out by the scriptures and the continuation of ceremonies and baptisms and suppers and sacrifices and ordinances past the cross. That's the cunningly devised fable. Now, he says here that he came in to fulfill. Now, you understand that is in your Bible. That is in everyone's King James Bible. Fulfill means to complete. And so that's a fact. Now, um, what I want to do is go up and pick up Second Peter, uh, first chapter and the, the first verse. Second Peter 1 and 1, Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Yahshua the Messiah, to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of Yahweh, Yahshua our Savior, Yahshua the Messiah. So to the righteousness of Yahweh and our Savior, Yahshua the Messiah, who is Yahweh manifested um as the savior. Mm -hmm. He was manifested as Yahweh Elohim uh, and appeared to Moses in the vision. And then he was manifest as a man. And now uh, Yahshua is a Holy Spirit abiding within our hearts. And that's Yahweh manifest as salvation within our hearts. Read verse two, please. Verse two. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of, Yah of Yahweh and of Yahshua, our Savior. Now, um, go ahead and get for me John 8 and 32, I think it is. Um, and hold where you are here. Uh, we've got 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. That's a little slow. Oh, boy. Only seven minutes. Okay. John 8, 32. <laughs> and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Now, see, this is the purpose of this class, and uh, not just this Ithaca class, but these, these classes in the teachings of Dr. <laughs> Henry Clifford Kinley. Uh -huh. It is, oh, you know, you talk about cunningly devised fables. Um, Dr. Kinley himself was a, a minister, assistant pastor in the, in the Church of God, and he water baptized people and conducted services, and uh, he talked about getting ringing wet, with set, ringing wet with sweat, stick his finger in his ear and hoot and holler and everything else and preach up a storm and get people all excited, but Yahweh showed him that that wasn't the truth. And after his vision, he spent the rest of his life patiently and with authority trying to teach anyone who would listen uh, what the truth was. Now, grace and peace are multiplied to us. These blessings, this promise of a new covenant is operating through the knowledge of Yahweh and of Yahshua, our King, our Master, our Lord, and our Savior. Verse 3, please. Uh, grace I'll back, and back peace. to Second Peter, sorry. Yeah, Second Peter 1 and 2. Grace and Verse. peace be multiplied unto you knowledge of Yahweh and of Yahshua, our Savior. So you see, this is how Yahweh is operating. He's operating through the knowledge of Yahweh and of Yahshua, the Messiah, our Savior. And, um, you know, the Messiah himself said that you shall know the truth and the truth shall uh, set you free. Set you free. Mm -hmm. And See, that came to pass for the Jews on the day of Pentecost when they were made to know 
the significance and the reality of the things that they had witnessed. And then um, in Abraham, Yahweh had blessed the Gentiles. And so this blessing, this Holy Spirit was bestowed upon the Gentiles seven years later uh, when, Cornel uh, when Peter was preaching to Cornelius. And so then for seven years, it was the Jews only. You see, and the Jews were sent to preach the gospel to the Gentiles and to the world. And that was, um, Paul was set up as the epitome of that, as Paul was a Hebrew, and Paul himself uh, had a vision and revelation and received the Holy Spirit. And then Peter was sent, and while he was yet speaking, while he was preaching, while he was communicating with them the knowledge of Yahweh and of Yahshua the Messiah, that Holy Spirit fell on them and quickened them. And just as you require your physical breath to keep you alive, see, we require the, the Holy Spirit, the operation of the Spirit, to make us alive spiritually. Now, um, verse 3 in Peter, 2 Peter. According as his divine power has given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that had called us to glory and virtue. Now, you see, if you've been laboring, and many of us were laboring in various churches or trying to do various things in order to receive um, peace of mind. And so if you learn that uh, the Messiah came to fulfill these things that were contained, these ordinances, and he did not come to institute and reinforce you going to church and you physically tithing and so on and so forth. See, then that sets you free from the cunningly devised fables that have, been, have trapped you in bondage and in condemnation. But only if you recognize it as the truth. And that is the gift of the Holy Spirit, is the revelation of the significance of these things. Now, uh, verse four, please. For whereby are given unto us exceedingly great and precious promises. So you see this gospel with, takes us back into the law and the prophets, takes us back into all the different um, events that are portrayed in the Bible. And we learn about the promise that was given to Abraham. We learn about the Adamic transgression. We learn about the deliverance that was brought about through Noah. We learn about um, the, the covenant that was made with the children of Israel. We find out what the history of the children of Israel was and how uh, the second generation was born in the wilderness and went on and established that uh, kingdom of Israel and how Israel committed idolatry and went down into bondage. Now, um, we find out about this great and precious promises. Read. That by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Now, uh, it was in the scripture reading, and I don't have time, I only have, I'm probably uh, running on fumes, maybe I have a minute or two, but, um, and it's also, I think, in John 14, but it talked about that where I am, there you may be also, uh, not in so many words. It was, something was in the scripture reading according to, to that, but I don't have time to pick it up. So, but you see, it's the same thing here Peter is talking about that whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises. Uh, what's that? The promise of deliverance, the promise of a new covenant, the promise of having the spirit and the light and the knowledge of our, our creator and of his existence and of his purpose. See, actually living in our hearts, living in our understanding, living in our feelings, living in our thoughts, making us to know 
that he is real, making us alive spiritually, just as that breath of life makes us to be alive um, physically. Mm-hmm. Now, uh, verse five, because I've got to wrap this up. And besides this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue and to So you see, without knowledge. faith, it's impossible to please Yahweh. And faith, you are saved, uh, uh, was that Ephesians 2.8, you are saved by grace through faith, got to have the faith, but which is a gift of the Holy Spirit. So just as your physical breath is a gift, just as your physical eyeballs are as a gift, your ability to trust and have confidence in the existence of Yahweh and the operation of his purpose, it's a gift. And just as a seed grows, and we've talked about the gospel being a seed today and how it needs to grow in our heart, you see, this truth, this revelation, this Holy Spirit grows in our hearts. And so add to your faith, you read. Um, Where am I? And besides this, given all diligence, add to your faith virtue and to virtue knowledge and to knowledge temperance. You see, he hold it right there, please, and pick up. Um, See, so Peter was talking about the knowledge up above, knowledge, knowledge, knowledge. It's not that we do it ourselves through knowledge. This knowledge is a gift, and it grows. Read. And to to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness brotherly kindness, charity, or love, read, or if these things be in you and abound, they make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our master, Joshua the Messiah. Now we're out of time, folks, but you see, it's through the preaching of the gospel. It's through our ability to remember and keeping this in remembrance and having the Holy Spirit grow in our hearts according to Yahweh's promise. See that if these things be in us and abound, they make us to be not physical carnal creatures, but spiritual creatures. And uh, to be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Savior, Yahshua the Messiah. So this knowledge, this Holy Spirit brings forth the fruits of the Spirit. And that's Um, As he told Adam and even the garden, be fruitful and multiply, but they had to come down out of the garden. See, now we go back up into that spiritual garden and we bear that spiritual fruit. And we're out of time, but you could read about that in Galatians 5.22 and some other places. So I thank you for this opportunity. I I guess I ran a bit over. I'm sorry about that. And um, be safe and be at peace in the spirit of Yahshua. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Greg. <clears throat> and I'd like to thank everyone for coming today. Um, it's wonderful to have you all here um, and to come back, please. Um, and right now we, we're here every Sunday from 11 to 1. And that looks like it's going to continue for a while. So, um, hallelujah. Right now, we're going to do the doxology, which I'll be reading from the last two verses of Jude in the Holy Name Bible. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless in the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise Elohim, our Savior, to Yahshua the Messiah, our servant, belong glory and majesty, dominion and power, both before all time, now and ever. Let us all say in unity. Hallelujah. 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 Hallelujah.